Welcome to the complete tutorial on how to film, edit, and upload a YouTube video from scratch, step by step. Buckle your seat belts and get ready because maybe you wanna grab a journal to write something. If you're shooting videos on your phone or if you got your gear with you, gather it up, grab something to drink because in this video, I am gonna be walking you through how to prepare your gear and do your camera settings and shoot a YouTube video that gets views. We're gonna talk about thumbnails and doing thumbnail photography and how to edit your thumbnails, how to step-by-step -step edit your videos and then upload them on YouTube in the most comprehensive free tutorial on how to create YouTube content online period. And in between each part of this four part mega video, I'm gonna be answering the top questions from the Think Media community about each of these topics. But if we're just meeting, my name is Sean Cannell. I'm the author of YouTube Secrets and my passion is helping purpose-driven people build their influence with online video. But now it's time to start with part one of setting up our gear and filming our YouTube video. So buckle your seatbelts and let's just jump into it. When you're getting started in video, it can be frustrating because there's a lot to learn when it comes to the camera settings and what gear do you need. So in this video, I'm gonna be going through step-by-step -step how to create a YouTube video with the gear that I'm using, the exact settings on this Canon M50, but it'll be relevant for any kind of DSLR or mirrorless camera that you're using. And then ultimately how to edit and put it all together coming up. Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here, and this is Think Media, bringing you the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And on this channel, we do a lot of tech gear reviews as well as strategy videos on how to build your influence with social media. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. But hey, we're starting a four-part series where we're gonna be going through how to shoot a great YouTube video with a DSLR or a mirrorless camera like the Canon M50 or the SL2. I'm gonna be talking about how to shoot thumbnails and go from shooting the photos to editing them, then how to edit the video and then also upload it. So we're gonna take you concept to completion of creating YouTube content. So let's just dive into it right now with the gear we're gonna to use to create this video. So for the first part, let's get started with the exact gear we're using. And actually, we just put together a brand new guide that you can grab at thinkgearguide.com where we'll list out everything. I'll link to that in the description. But our main camera for this shoot is the Canon M50. And the reason I love this camera is because at around $600 with the kit lens, it's really the best all around camera for YouTube in my opinion still. I mean, with the flip screen and the mic input, and we'll talk about some of those things, but in the gear guide, we cover all types of different cameras for different budgets, so definitely check that out. But for the gear we're using, we've got the camera. The main lens I'm gonna be using for the video I'm creating for my other channel, Sean Thinks, is the 11 to 22 lens because it's wide, really good for small and tight shots to get a really wide shot and good for vlogging. Using a Tascar shotgun mic right on top here. A little bit later in the shoot, we'll use this Boya mic. And then I also have the kit lens. We're not really gonna be using that today, but we are gonna be using our 22 millimeter pancake lens a little bit later on for a nice crispy shot with a blurry background. And then finally, I've got a KNF Concept tripod here that I'm gonna be using because I'm gonna be creating this video as a solo creator, like many of us are in the Think community, right? And so this is the full kit. I've got an SD card in there. And all together, you could pick all this up for a little bit under $1,000. You don't need all of this to get started, but these are sort of like the ultimate kit, I think, to create some killer YouTube videos. So we're gonna start in just a second, but now let's talk about the settings before we start shooting. All right, now go ahead and grab your camera, no matter what camera you have to follow along, but if you've got your M50, grab it. And normally when you'd get started shooting video, you'd probably pick video mode on the top of the camera. And that's a great way to start. When you do that, you can actually uh, go into that video mode and you can put it on auto exposure. If you want the fastest way to get your camera set up and running, auto exposure is gonna be auto everything. It might not look the best in some motion in some situations, but it's really nice. Now you could also do manual and we love manual. And if you want every single detail to be adjusted, that's a great option too, but we've kind of figured out a hybrid mode for a simple way to do auto, and we'll show you what that is. So we're actually gonna start with TV on the top, which is shutter priority. And you can look that up for your camera. When it's in shutter priority, that allows us to prioritize what will make the video look 
the best. So let's talk about it. In shutter priority, what we're gonna do is hit the Q and we'll go through our settings. Now, first of all, we're gonna do auto white balance just so it's quick and fast. We're then we're gonna do auto picture style just so the colors look nice. If we were gonna color grade later, I would shoot on neutral, but because we want this to be a quick edit and export, drop it on YouTube, we just gonna have auto white balance, auto on, auto on that picture profile. And then I'm gonna choose an autofocus mode of my face, at least initially when I'm vlogging and I'm on camera, I'm gonna be shooting a video for my Sean Cannell channel of a home office tour. And so um, when I'm on camera, I'll do the face focus. And then when I'm shooting room shots, I can do kind of zone focus and tap certain areas. But then the biggest thing here now is, the, is our frame rate. And so if you want 24 frames a second, which is kind of a film look, you could choose that. If you want more slow motion or faster, if you're doing sports or something, you could do 60 frames. But typically I shoot at 29.97 or 30 frames a second. Now, if you once you pick your frame rate, and so pick 29 frames a second, uh, 1080p is perfect, is then your shutter follows the 180 degree rule, which means if you're shooting 30 frames a second, you want your shutter speed at 60. If you were shooting 24 frames a second, you'd want your shutter speed at 50. Again, it's double whatever your frame rate is. And so the cool thing about shutter priority is it's going to always keep our shutter at 60. Therefore, the motion will always look good in the video. And then finally, we're gonna go over to ISO here and actually put it on auto. So that way, the camera will um, adjust the lighting brighter or darker accordingly. Now, the final thing to note here is that this lens is, uh, we're picking it because we're shooting these wide room shots and it's really good for vlogging. It's the 11 to 22 Canon lens. But because the aperture is f4, it's a little bit dark. So the ISO might go up a little bit high, but we're just gonna live with that. I mean, it's, it is what it is, and ISO is where we're gonna get that lighting. And here's what I mean, is that if you want your video quality to look the best, you probably don't wanna go over ISO 400 or 800 on this camera. If you want to just kind of vlog and take people with you and you don't have extra lighting, well then it might go higher and it's just going to affect the image quality. One thing to remember about ISO is that lower is gonna be not as much light being let in, but it's gonna be a better image quality if you can get enough light or you can shoot outdoors. The higher you go, the more grainy the image is and the more it falls apart. So sometimes you need to go higher to get the light, but uh, keeping it as low as possible will keep your image quality as high as possible. And with that, we're ready to shoot. Okay, so I'm about to get started doing my home office tour shoot here, uh, but let's talk about the mic settings last. Now, because I'm gonna be vlogging like this, this shotgun mic is perfect. It's a $25 shotgun mic, and here's one setting that I love on it, is it has a plus 10 dB. Now, some mics have plus 20, but a lot of times that's too much and it'll make the audio too loud, but plus 10 is perfect. So I actually have the mic on, I've got just the high pass filter, um, just at normal, just normal. And then I've got the plus 10 dB, so it's cool. And so then I just go into the menu, head over to eight here on the camera settings, and we can go to sa sound recording. And we make sure the sound recording's on manual. Here's the thing, if it's on auto, it has this kind of AGC, auto gain control, which brings in a lot of noise and even hiss sometimes because it's searching for voices. So when it's on manual, it means the audio's locked. And so what's nice here is I can then take this setting right here and just get the gain perfect for my voice. And so if I'm right in front of the camera, I want it to be never hitting red and only really hitting that kind of 12 dB. That's our target. So if I'm in yellow, I'm in front of the camera, I go, okay, that's nice and clean. If I get a little bit further, and so that is gonna be really crispy audio settings. Our shotgun mic set up, our audio levels are ready, all of our camera settings are ready, so I'm ready to shoot my video. So a couple reasons why I love this setup is, of course, the flip screen, so I can always get a good shot composition of myself on camera. Uh, I love the wide angle lens, especially for like a room tour video because it gets very wide shots. But then I also love this Joby tripod because I can not just vlog with it and take people with me, but then I can quickly set it down and get a nice shot like this. So throughout this video, I'm gonna be moving from room to room, and this is a very versatile setup for all that content. If 
you're looking for some home office design ideas, you're gonna love this video. My name is Sean Cannell, and I've been a full-time entrepreneur for over four years now, freelancing well before that, and working from a home office. So in this video, I'm gonna be breaking down some of my favorite design and inspirational uh, images and various posters and things like that, as well as my charging stations and a couple other cool features that I think will give you some great ideas for your home office. Coming up. Now, after shooting a lot of scenes in vlog mode, I'm actually gonna be getting behind the camera now. And so a quick tip is you can just flip your shotgun mic so that'll keep the audio obviously going the right direction and clean and crispy. And then I also like to actually use the Joby uh, like this where I tighten it down and I get an added point of contact So now the camera can actually be a very steady shot if I want to walk people through the home office Give kind of a tour I can zoom in and the one other thing I'm gonna do here is switch the focus mode from face focus to Zone focus so now I can just tap on exactly what I want to be in focus And it's not going to be hunting for faces and potentially having focus issues um, but over here, that's also an Ikea bookshelf. And so you can see, I think that lifelong leaders are lifelong learners. I read a lot of books. I love to always be leveling up and working on myself. All right, so let's talk about a quick tip to help you organize your footage when you're creating YouTube videos. So I've been shooting this home office tour. I shot it in here, in the loft, in the other office. I shot behind the camera, in front of the camera. But what I'm considering all of that is a term to remember, it's called A-roll. In editing, it's gonna be the base layer of video footage, and the A-roll is typically the person on camera. It's where my audio is, where the main kind of narration is, et cetera. And then you've probably heard the term B-roll, the reason it's called B-roll, is then it's any extra clips that we would layer on top of the A-roll. So maybe while I'm sitting at a chair describing something, I can lay over a clip of the thing I'm describing. And so for the next part of the shoot, now that I've basically finished shooting the A-roll, I actually want to switch lenses. And so the reason I mentioned all the gear at the beginning was so that we can use a different lens and that is the Pancake 22 millimeter F2. Now there's a couple reasons to do this, but one of the main reasons is the aperture. And what I mean is that F2, this guy is F4, this one is F2, that is a big difference. What a faster aperture, and faster is the lower number, what an F2 aperture will do for you is allow the image to be better in lower light. It, basically is a wider aperture. It lets more light into the camera. And so in these darker scenes, like when I'm filming over here on F4, and remember our auto ISO settings, there's actually not a ton of light in these corners. This lens will make that look beautiful and be able to do better in lower light situations. This lens, mm, not as much. And then the other thing that F2 is gonna do for us is it's gonna give us a shallow depth of field and a blurry background. And so actually, before I finish out this video shooting some B-roll, what I'm gonna do is put the camera on this tripod, and that's what I'm gonna use this for. I'm gonna use this tripod to get some smooth panning shots of the room. Again, this is a room tour, kind of home office tour. And so what I can do on here is this k &F tripod has nice smooth panning. I'm gonna get some smooth panning shots and I'm gonna get a shot where I mount the camera on here, I'm much further away, and then that's what we're gonna use this Boya mic for. This mic is around $20. It's a lavalier like the mic that we're recording this Think Media video on. And so that way, if I get further away, I can get that blurry background, I can get the good audio, because if I'm too far away from my shotgun mic, the audio is not gonna be as good. So thanks for coming along with me for a quick tour through the Think Media offices. If you wanna see any of the various decor, now, could you skip past these other lenses and even this mic and still finish out this video? Of course, but I just kind of wanted to give you the complete kit that I would use so that I feel ready to create all the content necessary to tell a great story on YouTube. And so I just finished up shooting all of the B-roll clips that I wanted to shoot. Of course, I shot all the A-roll. And so that pretty much covers it. We have the gear, right, the settings. We went and shot all of our clips. Um, but there's one thing we need to do before we get to editing, and that is create the thumbnail. One of the biggest things people miss on YouTube is being like, oh shoot, I'm just gonna pull a clip out of the video for the thumbnail. 
Um, I recommend actually shooting specific thumbnail photography and then uh, I've got some tips in Photoshop for editing your thumbnail. So that's part two of this video. If you wanna watch that, click or tap the YouTube card or we'll link to the entire series in the description below. In part three, I'm gonna go through how I edit this video and then in part four, we'll talk about the best export settings and actually getting it uploaded on to YouTube. So check out the whole series and remember, you can actually download um, a complete gear guide with other tutorials, tips for smart smartphone accessories, not just the Canon M50, but all kinds of different cameras we recommend here at Think Media. Grab that for free at thinkgearguide.com. Now, let's jump into some questions from part one in the series from the Think Media community. So Sarah asks, what are some shortcuts to make the filming process quicker and more efficient? I think there's a couple tips that I have, and the first one is outline your videos. You know, prior planning prevents poor performance. Like the more you plan out your content ahead of time, the better it goes when you're filming it. I think also just having a checklist for your process. And throughout this entire mega video, there's gonna be a mega list of videos and resources in the description below. One of the top videos I have is on my YouTube checklist where I talk about batching. I try to shoot more than one video at once. I try to shoot two, three, four in a day. And so I have a couple shirt changes. I've outlined all those videos. I make sure the batteries are charged, all those kinds of tips. And so if you wanna learn more about that, Sarah, check out that checklist video in the resource guide. And thanks so much for the question. Dave asks, do I really need 4K or am I okay with 1080p? Cause my PC struggles a lot editing 4K clips. Well, two thoughts, Dave. The first one is I think 1080p is still fine. I mean, we're shooting this video in 1080p. Secondly, new information has come out that going into 2020, here in America, over 50% of homes now have a 4K TV in their home. You know, most of our smartphones have 4K resolution, even though they're a smaller screen. And so 4K is becoming more mainstream. Do I think you need it? No, I agree with you as well. It's harder to edit. It takes up more space on your computer. It can be a hassle. But if you really want a future proof, then it may be something you either want to invest in now or at least start thinking about and steering your content and your strategy towards for the future. James asks, can you do a little more on the custom settings for the M50? My first efforts with it were horrible. Well, James, first of all, no matter what camera you're shooting with, if you're watching this video, you gotta give yourself patience. Your first videos, they're gonna be your worst videos. And yes, we actually have a video where Omar on the Think Media team broke down some deeper custom settings for the M50. So we'll put that in the resource guide. M Tech Accessories asks, are you using a Tackstar microphone? Yes, for the M50 setup and the shotgun microphone that I talk about in the video we just watched, it is a Tackstar, great microphone that won't break the bank. Kath asks, how do you let your voice get heard on this overpopulated platform called YouTube? Great question, and not really the topic of this video, but what I'd recommend is our free YouTube masterclass. It's actually at thinkmasterclass.com, and I actually have a little spot that you can watch about it right now. Are you ready to start or grow your YouTube channel? Do you feel stuck and need help connecting the dots? Join this free web class where you'll learn the step-by-step -step playbook for YouTube success. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you grow their influence with video. Register today for this exclusive training at thinkmasterclass.com. Next question, Mike asks, when creating tutorials, is it best to shoot a short intro on what you're gonna be doing in the video or should you just get straight to the tutorial? Would it be beneficial to upload two versions, one with an intro and one without? So I would recommend actually these days here on Think Media, we're trying to get to the point quicker. You know, attention spans are getting shorter and shorter on YouTube. So if you do just dive straight into it, it's a lot of time what people are looking for. Maybe they know the title and the thumbnail has described the content, so you can just get into it quickly. However, it is also good to give some sort of an intro, set the context of the video, and eventually you might wanna introduce yourself. So my tips here, Mike, is to experiment, number one, get to the point as quick as possible, whatever that means for you, 
and don't upload two versions. I think that would just kind of be weird for your subscribers to have the same video, two different versions. What I would do is test different styles of videos, see which one performs best, and then double down on what's working. Jerome asks, is it necessary to always upgrade to a professional camera when making YouTube videos, or is there no problem from recording from your mobile device? I find it a lot easier and less time consuming editing from your mobile phone. Well, Jerome, it's a great point that you make here, and I have two thoughts. The first one is the best camera to start with is always the camera that you already have, which is probably your smartphone. And I know we're talking about the Canon M50 in this mega video, but a smartphone is a great way to get started. In fact, we have a four-part series here on Think Media where Heather breaks down how to shoot, edit, and upload just with your phone. So we'll make sure to link that up in the resource guide. From my perspective, one of the reasons why I like using a separate camera is number one, I don't like filling my phone with data. I mean, I already have take too many pictures and videos and Instagram stories as it is. So I like capturing to an SD card and keeping it clean so I can shoot the footage, capture it in a laptop or a computer and have editing be quick and keep the content separate than the content that's on my phone. Number two, if I'm gonna vlog it all, the front facing camera on our phones is typically not as good as the forward facing camera. Like, especially like on the newer iPhones or whatever, these cameras are amazing. The selfie camera is okay, but in video mode, it's not the best. Still perfectly fine for YouTube, but there's just something powerful about, I think a separate camera that can get you good quality, that has a nice selfie screen, you can capture it on an SD card and have a separate workflow and then have your phone be a separate part of that content process. But here's the deal. Always start with the camera that you have and in no way think that your camera is gonna limit you from success on YouTube. In fact, the rest of this video is still gonna help you shoot thumbnails and edit and you could do all of that just editing with the content that a smartphone or an iPad or something like that creates. So the best camera to have is always the camera you do have. Punch fear in the face and get started. Don asks, I'm curious whether the cameras you recommended have clean HDMI outputs. Now, for context, this is in case you would want to use a Canon M50 or an SL2, a 90D, a Sony camera for live streaming. You want to use the HDMI port to plug it into your computer and live stream to YouTube or Twitch. So it's a great question. I bought an SL2 before I even knew what a clean HDMI output was. I knew I wanted to expand into streaming, but I just didn't have all the information I needed. So I just ordered an SL3 for that feature going to be streaming at an event on Wednesday as a test drive of my setup. I love the question, John. Here's my best recommendation. There is a really cool device called the Cam Link by Elgato, and there's a Cam Link 4K by Elgato. It's a little device that plugs right into your USB port and then allows you to plug in an HDMI cable to capture a camera like the SL2, A6400, Sony, Panasonic, whatever brand, into that HDMI input. The reason you want a clean HDMI output, because if it's not clean, then maybe on the screen when you're live streaming, would it say like 999 photos, it'd show you the battery meter, it'd show you like brackets, it wouldn't be a clean image. And there's a few other issues that come up as well. Does it have unlimited record time or can the power stay on continuously? Because if you're live streaming off of a camera to your computer and the battery dies in the middle and you can't like plug it into a wall or get an external battery or anything like that, again, the camera's not gonna be ideal for live streaming. So if that's one of the priorities for you, go to the Cam Link website. I'll link exactly to the page in the resource guide of the Cam Link recommended cameras with clean HDMI outputs, and then you can predetermine if your camera will be ideal for streaming. For example, the M50 works, but it actually has some issues if you don't use third-party software. So if live streaming is a priority for you, definitely check out that page first before you invest in a camera. Martin asks, Aloha from Honolulu, Hawaii. I got a question. I'm still debating on what camera I should get for vlogging, the M50 or the A6400. What is the best microphone solution for the Sony A6400? Thank you very much. Appreciate the question, Martin. I still think that in 2020 and beyond, those are still two of the top cameras on the market. The M50, for definitely more budget, you can get these things refurbished off the Canon website for around $470 now. It's pretty crazy. That comes with a one-year warranty. And then the A6400 is just gonna be a bigger investment. I think now, 
the A6100 by Sony is a more accurate comparison feature for feature to the M50, and even that's a little bit more expensive. It basically comes down to this, Martin. When you invest in Sony, you're gonna pay more for the lenses if you get that wide vlogging lens. You're gonna pay more for the body when you're investing in that, but you're also gonna get 4K and be a little bit more future-proofed. I think the M50 is still great. That's why it's the main camera this series is based on. And so definitely check out the resource guide um, and we'll link to our main comparison of those two cameras. The decision's up to you. Here's the thing. In both cases, you're going to probably have everything that you want. Unless, of course, you really want to go deep in 4K, then it's definitely going to be Sony that I'd recommend. Okay, we're going to be answering some more questions in just a second after part two in the series, which is all about thumbnails. But if you're getting value so far, smash the like button. And now, in this next section of the mega video, we're going to talk all about shooting thumbnails from a photography standpoint and then editing them step by step in Adobe Photoshop. So let's just jump right into it. When it comes to getting views and growing your YouTube channel, thumbnails are a huge deal. So in this video, I'm gonna be sharing a few tips from my thumbnail process. And we're gonna be covering the actual photography of shooting the thumbnails. Now we're gonna take them over to Photoshop and just go through some basics about making your thumbnails pop more so people click on them so you can get more views on your videos. All that's coming up right now. Hey, what's up? Sean Cannell here with Think Media, bringing you the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And we're actually in a four-part series all about how to produce YouTube videos that get more views. In part one, we covered how to shoot a YouTube video. And I just finished up shooting with the Canon M50 here, a tutorial that if you missed that and you wanna watch it, I'll link to it on the YouTube card and put a link to it in the description below. And really it's something you can follow along with with any DSLR or mirrorless camera. But before we get to editing, which will be part three, we need to create our thumbnail. And the reason we have a dedicated video just for thumbnails is because it's that big of a deal. Now, one of the biggest mistakes people make, I think, is they forget to actually shoot intentional thumbnails. They Have you ever done that before? Let me know in the comments. You like finish up editing and then you go, oh shoot, what should the thumbnail be? And you look for a screenshot. I recommend shooting intentional photos that you think about, what are my emotions on my face? What am I doing in the image? What would people wanna click on? And so let's just dive into it right now. All right, now I should mention that if you wanna watch the final video from this tutorial series, it's over on my Sean Cannell channel. And what, what it's all about is a home office walkthrough with some home office decor ideas. And so what I want in the thumbnail is some way to show that off. And so what is cool about if you're shooting thumbnails by yourself, I recommend having a tripod and using the camera timer. And maybe you put yourself in front of like a simple background or whatnot and start the timer. You could also use the app. So if you use your phone, you can fire off photos from your camera in case you're creating as a solo creator and you need to go shoot your own thumbnails. In this case, I'm gonna put this in kind of a selfie mode. So I've got my Joby 3K on here and we are actually gonna set this in aperture priority, which is gonna focus on the aperture. That's gonna be at as low as it can go, F4, because the 10 to 22 lens, that's as low as it can go. And then on top of that, we're just gonna pretty much do ISO auto because that'll get the lighting perfect. And um, I'm going to go to the queue here, go to the timer and just put it on the selfie timer, two seconds. You know, 10 would be fine, but that's a long time to wait. So it's nice that the M50 has this two second timer. And then I'm going to, with the flip screen here, be able to compose the shot. And so as it is a home office tour, I'm going to be thinking about where am I looking? I wanna make sure I'm looking at the lens, not the selfie screen. Um, or maybe I want to look to the left or the right. So when it comes to thumbnails, one of the biggest things I think about is emotion. A couple tips on thumbnails. Usually people in the thumbnails is stronger. On YouTube, tests have shown that if you see people's eyes, you see emotions on their face, it can really pull you in. Now, that gets exaggerated and we've all seen those really bright thumbnails with crazy faces, but I think there's something to it. So always include your own style. So my goal here would be to uh, think about where am I in the shot and think about kind of the background of the office here. And then all I gotta do to start firing off some photos is uh, do that two second timer. It's got the crispy photo on there. Now, another tip here is shoot multiple photos. 
for big videos that are very important to us, sometimes we even shoot photos in different places. Like maybe I wanna shoot one out there or here. I think this is gonna be perfect for this particular scene. Uh, additionally, if you wanna keep things simple, just having your camera set to a, a JPEG um, image, which is your most basic type of image, is fine. And basically you're gonna be able to use the photo right out of the camera. Sure, you can make some edits to it. But because um, I've got the Adobe Creative Cloud, which I highly recommend as you evolve in your journey, I use Lightroom, Photoshop, Adobe Audition for audio, and Adobe Premiere for video editing, and then After Effects if needed for motion graphics, but I usually don't take it that far. And so all of that comes in the Adobe Creative Cloud. If you actually wanna do a trial, I'll throw a link to it in the description below. You can, I think, try it out free for a few days. And um, what's cool about that though is I wanna make sure I shoot in raw. And that way, if, if the image is too dark or I wanna change the white balance, it just gives me a lot more flexibility later. So that's another setting I have it on. I'm actually shooting large JPEGs and I'm shooting um, raw as well. So it says that's the large JPEG right there. And then you've also got raw. This new one is actually a Canon Creative Raw. That'd be good too. If you've got your Lightroom or your Photoshop updated, again, to keep it simple, don't even worry about this. But if you want the best, you know, quality possible. I've got it to raw. So now let me shoot a couple different versions. I'd like to probably shoot six to 12 photos because you can always delete them. But once you're sitting down later to edit and you're like, you know, it's dark out and the light's all gone. And you're like, crap, I, it's, I don't really have any good options. I've never regretted overshooting. So let's get a couple more right now. All right, nice clean light. I like it with the eyes looking over. I can always crop the image. Last thing I'm gonna do here as we get towards our, you know, we're shooting about 12 different photos, is I wanna actually really go rule of thirds. And so when I think about shot composition, there's all these nice posters over here. Over here is the chair and some other clutter. So what I'm gonna do is get my focus right and then kind of shift the shot so it shows off the office. So basically I'm framing myself up behind the, all this stuff I don't wanna see. I love the camera lenses over there. I always like to put myself as close to the edge of the thumbnail as possible, really thinking about the framing. And again, I don't mind having options. So here we go, let's just do one final one. Okay, so we shot our thumbnails on the M50, so now let's pop the SD card out and capture those files. Okay, now that our files are captured, let's look through our options and then we'll pull them into Photoshop. And so here's the full shoot. I can open these up and then kind of click through. That one's a little bit out of focus and that's why it's nice to shoot multiple, right? You have different options that you can go through to look for the one that you ultimately want to use. Um, I really like this one. I kind of would crop it right through here. So maybe we'll go with that, but let's look through these other ones. And remember, by having lots of thumbnail options, you can potentially get like that perfect emotion or facial expression that you want. I really like the eyes looking because it directs attention to maybe some words that we can put on here. So let's go with this one. It's 8828. This raw file, dra drag this over here to Photoshop and perfect, loving this photo. And now I've got camera raw settings, which again, when you shoot in raw, you're gonna be able to have more kind of micro adjustments to maybe, I actually kind of want the background to be a little bit darker because it's all about emphasizing, um, you know, me for a thumbnail, the face really matters, the eyes matter. If you can include the eyes have those, they've just, there's just been studies done that have shown that um, eyes and human faces perform really well in thumbnails. So this photo is looking pretty great right as is. And uh, of course we could do a lot of adjustments and things to it, but I think we're pretty good to go with it um, the way it is. So what I'm gonna do is actually press Control J. I'm using a PC that duplicates the layer. And so that I can change our canvas size. And this is gonna allow me to um, go to the exact thumbnail size of a 1080 thumbnail. And so 1920 by 1080 is the resolution. If I click over here, I'm gonna hold shift to maintain the resolution while I do this or maintain the, so the image doesn't get stretched weird. Control plus to zoom in. And this gives me the ability to sort of adjust the image inside of the frame that will go on YouTube. And kind of got those cameras behind me. I don't know if anyone would notice what those are. So those might 
those lenses might be unnecessary. The main thing people are going to maybe see is this kind of cool light. And all right, so we've got that. And next thing I want to do is add some text here. Now, the title of this video, I like planning ahead. If you can research before you press record, is going to be 10 cool home office design ideas. But I, one mistake people make is trying to include every single word in their title and their thumbnail. You don't need all of them, but sometimes it's nice to put some words in your thumbnail. So I'm using the text tool and I'm going to go with uh, one of my favorite fonts, which is Helvetica, uh, Helvetica New. And then there's lots of niche fonts inside of there. So I'm going to go Helvetica New Black Italic. That's one of my favorites. Perfect. Okay. So do that, change that over to white. You got my toolbar here. Let's zoom in on our Photoshop. All right, cool. And one of my favorite things is just keeping it really simple and readable. So I'm going to drag a little rectangle box. Now Photoshop works by layers in the lower right hand corner of your screen. You can see that there are layers. So cool is above this little box now. Um, and I think what we'll go for is if I go cool, I can stretch this up. I can make this larger, really easy. I'm always holding shift to preserve the, um, to make sure that everything stay, doesn't get stretched weird. One of the big mistakes people can make is skewing their image, like stretching a face wrong or something can look really, uh, really ugly. So we're going to go cool and put this kind of above because the, the way the image is looking, I'm going to fit sort of my text right up here. Now I'm going to press control J that duplicates the layer. So I was selected the layer cool over here. Now it's cool copy. And so I can um, change the word to office. So we'll go office, stretch this out. Cool office. Now for some contrast, I'm going to make office black. And so it stands out a little bit more between the cool, put my control bracket left or right to make the layer go higher or lower. The other way you could do that is you can just drag layers over here above and below um, your word. So there's the office word, there's the white rectangle below it. I can uh, tilt that grabbing the edge of it, rotate it a little, shrink down my um, the box around it. Perfect. Cool office. And then finally, we'll go ideas. So same thing, right? The full video title in this case is going to be 10 home office design ideas, but you don't need to repeat every single word. So it's just what is the main thing people are looking for? They're, they're looking for home office stuff. Uh, duplicated my white box. I'm going to switch it back to black now. I think I did that accidentally twice. So let me delete one of those layers. Control bracket to lower that layer down. Delete one of those extra rectangles. Perfect. So now I, ideas is got some emphasis and you know, your style, I encourage you of course to always have your own style and not that my style is right or wrong, but one priority that I have is clarity. Like I really believe online that if you confuse, you lose. And so I want, um, I like simple fonts. I like readable fonts. Sometimes if things get kind of more too cursive too comic sans, they just are hard to read. And so, um, you want, I like clarity over, over being clever or being kind of even cool, right? So just nice and simple, right? So we've got cool home office ideas. I still got my layer here. If I want to move me a little bit over here, whatever, I'm looking right at the ideas and beyond that, we're pretty much done, but there's a few things that I also like to do. I do realize that think about your thumbnail when it's online. Sometimes the title is over top. So if you can move text away from the edges, that helps. Also avoid putting text in the lower right hand corner because that's where the time code is on YouTube, right? Just thinking through those best practices. My final thing that I like to do, I'm going to put a layer right above my photo and it's going to be levels. And levels gives me three sliders over here on the right that will really see I can make the image brighter. And I can also pull it from this side and make it much more contrasty and make it kind of darker. So what I like to do is really get the thumbnail to pop. Something with uh, when it comes to thumbnails that people have studied is that you usually want to go a little bit of extra saturation. I can do another adjustment layer for that. I could go um, vibrance on here and I could add a little bit more vibrance. It's going to make it 
a little extra, maybe more than you would normally do if you wanted your skin tone to be more matte and natural. But again, a thumbnail is so small, you want it to pop. So that's a little bit of extra vibrance and saturation. The levels can kind of pull it up a little brighter. But if we want the background to be a little bit darker, kind of, and uh, we're pretty much we're pretty much there. Sometimes this is a little bit more advanced. This is kind of just a beginner's thumbnail uh, tutorial, and I encourage you, you know, check out uh, some training links in the description below if you want to go deep in Photoshop and really master it. But one of the things I like to do, I'm going to add a blank layer here, and I'm going to use the gradient tool. Make sure my gradient's on black, and so it is. And so if I drag from here. I can do an, a gradient just like that. That makes it, um, and I'm deleting it just to kind of, and then I can use opacity, opacity here to come down and just sort of even darken that edge so maybe this stuff pops more, cool home office ideas. But at some point you could endlessly tweak, right? The details of, of something like this. So I think that um, really we're good to go and that this should be a super solid thumbnail. So now our final step here is to just go file, save as, and in our final format, what I like to do is I keep everything organized on Dropbox um, by month, and that way we can, um, I can get to it easy from my phone and, and whatever else. But what I really like to do is save the PSD so I can always reopen it and edit it later if I need to. So I might tile it, you know, 10 cool home office uh, ideas. And then I save that Photoshop file in case I want to open it later to reuse it. And then I'm going to say save as JPEG. And that is the exact file that we will upload later to YouTube as our thumbnail. Okay, so a few other things you need to know about thumbnails. And the first is, again, if you want to use Photoshop, I understand this was not like a super exhaustive tutorial on Photoshop. There are free ones of those on YouTube, or you can check out a site like Linda. So I definitely recommend skilling up if you want to use Photoshop. But I think that some of the concepts can be applied here. Also, we'll be covering more uh, thumbnail tutorials in the future here on Think Media because we shoot them definitely outdoors, different variety, whether you're shooting by yourself or you have someone helping you. So look forward to those videos in the future and make sure you're subscribed. Also, if you've been getting value out of this video, can you smash the like button? And here's what is next. Um, the next video is now about editing. In part one, we shot all the footage with the M50. In part two, this video, it's all about getting the right photography and editing up your thumbnail. But then in part three, I'm now gonna edit the footage that I shot into our final video. This is all going into a video that you can watch on my Sean Cannell channel so you can see the final product. So I'll link to that on the YouTube card and put it in the description below. And then of course in part four, we're gonna be talking about exporting it with the best settings for YouTube, helping walk you through concept to completion for creating content with whatever camera you have, but especially if you have the M50. Okay, hey, if you're still in the mega video, let me know in the comments section below. We just finished up part two all about thumbnails and now I wanna take the top questions from the Think Media community. And the first one comes from Zachary asking, I'm not sure that mine do the best job captivating. My question is, how can I figure that out if I think that they're good? And you're, you're right, Zachary, sometimes we need to get feedback when it comes to our thumbnails. And so a couple tips, I actually like to design at least two thumbnails for each video, if possible, like two options, and then share those on social media. So a lot of times I'll post on Twitter, thumbnail one or two, and if you're followed by 10 people or 100 people, or maybe you have more people on Instagram, just ask people which one they would click on first or which one stands out better, and that can help you narrow down what people would actually click on. Because you know when we're just creating content by ourselves, it's hard to get feedback. My friend Jeremy also has a thumbnail Facebook group, and every week he says, hey, post your thumbnails where people can uh, give each other feedback on thumbnails, so I'll make sure all of this stuff is in the resource guide that I put in the description below. And other than that, I think keep testing and try to get as much feedback as possible from your audience. The last tip is it's all about click-through rate. At the end of the day, YouTube in your studio beta analytics will actually show you the click-through rate of your videos. Now, a lot of things actually go into determining that from the title to the topic itself, but thumbnail is a big determining factor of whether or not your videos are gonna get clicked on. So make sure to uh, study your analytics and of course, subscribe here on Think Media for more tips about growing your YouTube channel in the future.
Tim asks, what size should it be? I make all my thumbnails in 1920 by 1080 resolution. That's a standard 1080p resolution. I do that for a couple reasons. Last time I checked, it's what YouTube recommends. If you wanna be future-proofed, you could design your thumbnails in 4K, but there is a size limit on the file size where YouTube will reject your thumbnails, so 1080p seems to be good. And I also don't like to do smaller than that. A lot of people will do like a 720 resolution, but I wanna be as future-proofed as possible and use those same files to share on Twitter, to share on Facebook, to keep archived on my computer so I can use them later and have them in their highest quality possible. So 1920 by 1080 resolution. Daniel asks, how do you determine the right style and thumbnail for your videos and channel? It's a great question. I think a couple things come into play. Number one, what is your preferred branding? You know what I mean? Like if you think about it, a lot of times people just copy other people on YouTube and they're just influenced by their style. But if you wanna be different, like do you want your branding to be clean and modern? Do you want it to be chic and stand out? Do you want it to be uh, very hip and cool? Or do you want it to be cartoony and kind of you know, gamerish and futuristic? Think about your branding, not just for your thumbnails, but for your channel overall. Secondly, if you do want to kind of ride the trends, ask yourself, what are other people doing in your industry that are winning? Like what are the top ranked videos? What do their thumbnails look like? If you're in fitness, what do the top ranked thumbnails look like for fitness? If you're in cooking, what do the top ranked thumbnails look like when you search certain search terms and you get ideas from the videos that are performing well, you can take a few clues that maybe your thumbnails should be similar to those videos. However, it's sometimes smart to do something different than what everybody else is doing so that you stand out. And then the last tip is just to test. You know what I mean? I think it's a combination of testing what your branding is mixed with what's working and what's getting the best click-through rate. You know, here at Think Media, we've been evolving our thumbnails a little bit. We're doing less text lately. We're doing more cameras and less people in the thumbnails, but we're testing, you know? I can't even say that that's better than the past. We don't have all the data yet, but I think keep it fresh, always try something new, and don't forget to test and double down on what's working. My man Jaden asks, how do you add colors around your face? How do you add cool colors when you make thumbnails around camera tips? Just generally, how do you make your thumbnails have color, it sounds like? Well, besides the tutorial that I just shared, which was kind of a 101 basic going through Photoshop type of a tutorial, I have another video that's a little bit older, but it actually talks about how to use free software on canva.com. And there's a paid version too, but I'm pretty sure you can do at least a trial or use limited features in the free version. I'll link that video in the resource guide. And it's hard to explain in a Q&A like this. I think there, in some of our advanced trainings that we have in our members areas and whatnot, I do have some deeper dives of how exactly I make the thumbnails of video influencers and think media. I still do all of that thumbnail design myself. And so my biggest tip, if you want to go into that kind of stuff, would be to learn Photoshop at another level. I think it's the most powerful software and you could use something like LinkedIn Learning. You could watch free YouTube videos about it. You could look at other Photoshop tutorials or a mini course on Photoshop, Skillshare, and I'll put some resources in the resource guide of things like that. If you go through a couple, you know, take a weekend or take a couple weekends to really go deep in Skillshare or LinkedIn learning on Photoshop, and then you're gonna have the skills needed to not just design powerful thumbnails, but to also design powerful graphics for your business overall. As content creators, come on, we need to be so doing social media, graphics for our email newsletters maybe, graphics for our websites. And some of you as business owners are gonna hire that out, but some of you, that's a skill that you're gonna to wanna to learn. So either invest in the training to learn it. If you wanna go deeper in some of our stuff, of course we'll have information in the resource guide. And other than that, check out that free Canva tutorial, because remember, done is better than perfect, so keep it simple and get your thumbnails out. Little Sparrow Redbreast asks, text or no text? And that's the ultimate thumbnail question. And I'd say a couple things. First of all, in my opinion, design aesthetics matter. So if you are using text or not, 
Don't use too much text. Don't pack the thumbnail so that's unreadable. Don't use fonts that are hard to read or confusing or that just disappear on the background. Don't restate your title in text on your thumbnail. But if you are gonna use text, use as few words as possible. I like to use under five if possible, if not just one, two, or three, like some kind of a emphasized type of a thing. And then I will also say, that lately I've been trying to use no text. Of course, you can look at someone like a Peter McKinnon who's like famous for these beautiful thumbnails, no text, and he uses his title to tell the story. Alternatively, you need to study your niche because again, look at the top performing videos in your particular channel topic. Sometimes text is very important because if you're doing a tutorial or a workout or some a cooking video and maybe the the text on the thumbnail is actually gonna be instructive or help bring clarity to what someone's about to watch. It has less to do with aesthetics and more to do with practicality. I think these are some of the things to consider. And then last of all, test everything. I think that's what we're doing here on Think Media. We experiment, we test, we wanna find a design aesthetic that works with also a practicality and something that gets results. And so we're always testing and we're always experimenting with both my little red sparrow friend. Save Jesse Crouch Crew asks, I just started doing this, would there be any benefit to going backwards and adding thumbnails or updating the thumbnails to older videos as well? I do think there's benefit to this. When I was part way into my journey at Think Media, I had some early videos that were pretty good content and the thumbnails, I just didn't put any energy into them at all. So once my design skills up leveled a bit and I wanted to kind of refresh the videos, I took like a Saturday morning and I just went back and I updated my best videos. I didn't do my whole library. I think that might be wasted energy, but there was a few that I wanted to not only update, but then I re-promoted them because then I had a new thumbnail, which gave me a new graphic to share on Facebook, to share on Twitter and say, hey, go check out this video. Video might've been two, three years old, but now it kind of had a fresh look to it with the new thumbnail. And that also gives it a chance to rank and perform more in the future because thumbnails are a big deal. If you can get people to click, and watch your videos and increase that click-through rate and that average view duration and all of those important YouTube metrics in 2020 and beyond, it can be a game changer for your YouTube channel. So Ben asks, letting go of perfectionism is the hardest part for me. If you change your thumbnail later on down the road, does it affect analytics? Well, Ben, I love the question. First of all, I can totally relate. I mean, there are some days, some nights where I spend probably way too much time over analyzing my thumbnails. I keep tweaking them, I keep testing them, I change them, I lay in bed and I think, I wonder if I should have done it a different color or if the logo should have been bigger. And then I like sometimes will get up and change it more. At some point, Ben, you have to just let it go. Frozen 2, I don't think that song's in the movie. Let it go and release it to the world. Just put it out there. Now, is there benefit to changing the thumbnail down the road? There can be. And there's two things here. Number one, it won't affect your analytics or it won't affect the algorithm. YouTube won't really know the difference. What they will know is if it gets more click-through rate on it, if it gets better engagement. And so friends of mine that really want their videos to perform well will test and look at their analytics after three, four, five days, see if their click-through rate is something they're happy with, and then they will go back and change the thumbnail if they think it could be improved. I never do that. I at some point make it as good as I possibly can, release it to the world, and then think about the next video. I really believe that for a lot of us, it's your next video that's gonna be your best video, not worrying about over-optimizing your past videos. So done is better than perfect. Get it to a good level, don't overthink it. Guess what? Something's probably wrong with it. Would blue have been better than yellow? Maybe. Would red have been better than pink? I don't know. If you did this face instead of that face, you'll kind of never know at some point. Forward action and massive action is always where the action is. And so, yeah, do it as good as you can and then um, put it out there in the world and on to the next video. Jay asks, I think I make an okay thumbnail for my videos. What would you say is the one element that can take it to the next level to be suggested by YouTube? Jay. The top elements for me are number one, it's gotta stand out. Now that might seem obvious, but I mean, it literally needs to pop off the page in some way. If the colors are dull, if it's messy, if the image, if the story the image is telling is undiscernible, like it's just kind of confusing, then it's not gonna work. What you want is it to leap off the page. 
So one thing to consider is also, if you're trying to like rank for a video, you want your video to probably be different than the other videos or just in some way unique so that it leaps off the page. If you said, what's the one element? Well, there's a few. I think color is a big deal. It doesn't have to be crazy rainbow colors like some YouTube, you know, just super bright and crazy, but I think some pop of color helps it stand out. We've also learned that emotion really helps it stand out. And I know as YouTubers, we're, a lot of times we can go extreme and we're like rah, with our faces and, and then people just imitate that and I'm guilty of that as well, but there's science behind it. People respond to emotion. Just no emotion at all gets less clicks. If you're happy or sad or confused or suspicious or there's drama and you do the scared face and then you talk about the coming doom and gloom because drama is popular and drama gets clicks, then you tie in all those elements together and those can make your thumbnails much more powerful. So I think emotion, I think color, and then I think clarity. At the end of the day, I think that less is more on thumbnails. If we, get, if we try to get too many words, too many things, if, you know, I try to think about ways to tell a story. If I wanna say how to build a YouTube studio, I probably can't show the whole studio. You know what I mean? Because if it's too far zoomed out, unless it's a really clean shot, if it's too messy, if it's too busy, if you confuse, you lose. So how can it be colorful, have emotion, be very clickable, and how can you make sure it stays clear and tells the story that you want it to tell? This is a big challenge, Jay, but if you can pull that off, then you've got a winning thumbnail. Okay, so take a deep breath. You know, this YouTube thing is no joke. A lot of work goes into it, but YouTube is one of the most powerful platforms on the planet for getting your message out there, for building a life and a business on your own terms. And so learning this process and mastering shooting videos and creating content is a big deal. And so now we're gonna be going into the third part of the series, which is all about editing, right? We've shot our video, we've shot the photography for our thumbnails, we've planned all that out, and now we're ready to take all of our footage, we're gonna capture it on the computer, drop it in Adobe Premiere, and edit. And here's the thing, if you have some kind of a different video editing software, I think that you're still gonna get a lot of insights out of the editing psychology, as well as if you wanna use Adobe, that's what I use. I use the Adobe Creative Cloud, I use Photoshop and Adobe Premiere and Adobe Audition for audio, all under one roof, Lightroom for editing photos that I use for social media, and that's what our whole team uses as well. We buy different seats, and that way we're all able to be on the same software. And so we'll include links to all that kind of stuff in the resource guide, but now it's time to get into the third part of the series all about editing, so let's just jump right into it. So if you wanna level up your content, editing is one of the best ways to do it. And in this video, I'm gonna be going through a beginner tutorial on Adobe Premiere about how to edit a YouTube video. I'm also gonna be sharing a few tips from my workflow and even some advanced insights. So let's just dive into it right now. Hey, what's up? Sean Cannell here with Think Media, bringing you the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And right now we're in the middle of a four-part video series all about how to shoot, do a thumbnail, edit, and then ultimately upload a YouTube video so you can put out better content, grow your channel faster, and get more views. And if you actually wanna watch part one or two, in part one, we did a whole uh, video on shooting content with the Canon M50 or a similar DSLR or mirrorless camera. In video two, we talked all about getting the thumbnail ready and we're already done with that. And now it's time to actually edit our video. And so that's what we're gonna be doing right now in part three. If you missed out on the beginning of the series, I'll link it up on the YouTube card as well as post a link to that playlist in the description below. But with that, let's dive right into how to edit a video in Adobe Premiere. All right, so step number one is take the SD card out of our camera, plug it into our card reader. In this case, I've got an extra long one plugged into my computer with this crazy cable so I can just easily get to it. But whether you're on a laptop or you have a PC or some kind of a tower, you definitely need an SD card reader. Capture your footage, and right now I've already actually downloaded it into an external hard drive. And here's how I organize some of my files. I've got my footage folder, and this is all of the footage that I shot in video number one, including the A roll and the B roll. I've actually got the music folder, and we'll talk about that in a bit. The thumbnails, and we already created our thumbnail, but that's where I would save all the image files. 
And then I've actually got my intro bumper. Now, if you don't have one made, you don't need one, but this is just my little bumper for my Sean Cannell channel. And if you actually wanna watch the final video, I'll link to that and post it in the description below as well. If you kind of wanna see it either before or after, definitely check it out so you can see the final result. So what we're gonna do is we have Adobe Premiere open. And if you've never used Adobe Premiere, it's a little bit more advanced, but I highly recommend it. So if you wanna do a trial, I'll put a link to it in the description below. And I use Premiere for editing video, and then I used Photoshop to edit my thumbnails. And so we're gonna do a new project here. And we are going to name it, right? So this was a Sean Cannell, uh, is the YouTube channel I'm posting this on, and it was a home office tour. So I'm gonna do that. And we also, everything else here is pretty much good to go. And what's cool about Premiere lately is that it really will understand. In the past, you could select certain sequences and projects, and this might sound kind of crazy, but you'd have different frame rates and you'd, you maybe need to know some technical details ahead of time. What's cool about Premiere now is you don't need to know those technical details. You can just drop your footage in and it'll know how to interpret it for you. So here is the Premiere homepage. It says right over in the lower left, import media to start. That is our first step, or we ultimately could drop the media right on the sequence uh, place here, and then that's gonna fill in these windows up here um, with other content once we do that. So I'm actually gonna select all of my clips and just drop them straight into the sequence because now, right now, it's importing all of our footage from um, what we shot with the Canon M50. All right, so now the footage is actually all in the timeline. Right now in the lower, very left-hand corner, you can see that it's conforming the audio, which actually means that those waveforms are kind of showing up on here. So here's what I mean. If we wanna make our two main kind of uh, visuals here a little larger, this is our first layer of video and audio. And here's what I want you to think about. Right now on the screen, we can see some of the preview footage. And if you remember in video number one, we talked about A roll and B roll. And so essentially, if this is your A roll, which is your layer video number one here, maybe we wanna pull in some B roll. Here's all of our B roll clips, but we don't need the audio on there. So I just unlinked the audio. Now I've got that clip uh, released. So I could be talking in the A roll here but then it could show the B-roll while I'm talking. So it makes sense? So there's the B-roll clip, there's the A-roll clip, and I'm able to just drag and drop and move things all around here in the timeline. And so I'm actually gonna delete this because of the order, and I'm going to uh, sort this by name to get all of the files in the order I shot them, because they were in some kind of crazy order when I first dropped them into the sequence. So now, when I take these all into the sequence, here's the cool thing. The main video should just be all the way through here until this is all the main video that I shot. Here's my outro. And what I'm doing on the timeline here is I'm using the hotkeys minus and plus to zoom in with plus minus to zoom out. See that? So I can zoom into the edit. And so now if I actually go to here, this was all the B-roll clips. So I'm gonna move those off to the right. And here's the deal. I actually don't need any of the audio on these clips. and so. What I did is I right clicked, I clicked unlink. And so just to clean it up, this is the way I do it, is I just I'm taking this waveform to delete all that audio. This is all B-roll clips, makes sense? So those will go in later. And what I'm gonna do is start with the A-roll, the audio here. And so uh, okay. I'll turn this up right. a little so you can hear it. Right. And um, I'll creating, all right, setting up your home office in a way that, all right, setting. Now, one of my biggest tips when it comes to editing is watching the audio. I've learned so much by being able to, obviously none of this matters, so I can just drag and hold and trim that clip down on the left um, because I'm restarting, I'm messing up, and it looks to me like I'm actually starting like right here, so let me see. Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here, and in this video, I'm gonna be doing a home office tour with a bunch of cool home office design ideas, whether that's ergonomics from the various chairs and ways of... Uh... All right, messed up again. So. Now I'm gonna look at this one. If you're one. looking for some home office design ideas, you're gonna love this video. Now check this out, there's a hot key called L, and I realize this is a beginner tutorial, but you're kind of seeing inside of my workflow. So ways I go faster is pressing the L button to speed up. My name is Sean Cannell, I've been a full-time entrepreneur for over four years now, freelancing well before that, and working from a home office. So in this video, I'm gonna be breaking down some of my favorite design and inspirational images and various posters and things like that, as well as my charging stations and a couple other cool features that I think will give you some great ideas for your home office. Come in. Now, 
a tip there is having a strong hook in your videos. And that was the hook, that was the opener, right? So now I'm actually gonna drop in from my file folder the bumper. And if you've got one of these created, what you can do is just have it start right after um, your intro ends. Come in. Boom. So there's the intro, very nice. And now I can cut into the video itself. And the main thing I do is I just work through from left to right basically on the edits. And I try to look at the waveform to see when I maybe got the intro right. So it looks like I, hey, what's up, I probably restarted. Hey, what's up, hey, what's up? Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell hey, what's up? here? Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here? Okay, and welcome four to tries. Channel, which is, hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here? And welcome to my channel, which is all about going further, faster, in life and if we're just meeting i'm actually a full-time entrepreneur that is mainly creating content over my channel think media but today i just want to take you uh, on an office tour and let's just start right here in my main office and so we're sitting here at my desk i've got a couple uh, monitors here my triangle light from spiffy gear and uh, this is where the magic happens now i actually have a full video out on um, all about uh, this whole setup so if you want to check it out i'll link to it in the description below put it on the youtube card but let's go through some of these oh that's all right but let's check out what's happening in this room all right uh, i'll link to the youtube card uh, all right uh, but let's start out but let's start out with some of the decor but let's start out with some of the decor but let's start out with some of the decor. All right, so getting rid of all this stuff, going back to the butt. Put it below and put it up on the YouTube card. But let's go through some of these. All right, boom. Little uh, tip right there. It, one of my favorite features is I can right click in between and say ripple delete and then just boom, bring it all back nice and clean. So if we replay this. For home office, coming up. Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here. And boom, to and now we're going into the actual video. And so now you can see what I'm gonna do is go through the rest of the edit of the A roll. I'm gonna be just trimming through all of the clips, bringing them back, and then we'll do B roll after that. So when I think of home office, does, all right. So one of the questions I get, all right, so one of the huge priorities for me, so one of the huge, so one of the big priorities for me, so one of the biggest, uh, so one of the big priorities for me in my, uh, so one of the big priorities for me in my home office is inspiration. I love inspiring quotes, motivational messages. And I get a lot of questions about these kind of like posters and things. And so these are actually from startupvitamins.com. I'll link to those guys in the description if you want to check them out. And so kind of got that decor up there, installed some shelves and have some other kind of inspirational images that's coming out there. And also another one as well, kind of all going, different pieces, different places like 96. Um, there's also pieces from Upmunk, like their cell. And over here we've got one, slow and steady wins. And so I'll give you a comment, what's up with your walls? It's a little time kind of involving my cell, but up there as well as on motivational pictures throughout my entire office here at home. Home. Another, uh, now another bit, uh, now another bit, now another big theme, another bit, now another big theme is ergonomics. In fact, one of my favorite features in my home office is this Herman Miller Arion chair. Now these chairs, these things cost a lot of money. You are probably thing. thing. But here's the thing. You are probably going to be you. You are probably, you're probably going to be working a lot. Like I've been using this. Now another getting. But here's the thing. You're probably going to be working a lot. Like I've been using this chair for years now, and the thing is indestructible, and it has micro adjustments. You can adjust the arm height, every little detail, so that you can keep your posture right, your health right. I've also got uh, you know an ergonomic keyboard over here, old school man. You remember that? I got the old uh, Microsoft mouse, but even like ergonomic uh, keyboard, and installing this tray under my desk. I ordered this on Amazon. Screwed into the bottom of this IKEA desk, and and that allows me to get perfect. And that allows me to get perfect ergonomics while I'm sitting here in my desk to be able to work longer without straining my arms or, or hurting my body. Or get... All right, so now let's... Okay, so one note. Um, all right, now one of the tips we shared in the first video was when I'm in front of the video, I had the shotgun mic pointed at me, but when I got the behind the camera, I had the shotgun mic pointed back at me, but I was speaking like right into it. So the audio is a little bit louder. So what we're gonna do here in Premiere is I'm just gonna go audio gain minus three for now. And that'll let us go a little bit more sore. quiet. All right, so now let's check out the bookshelf. Now all this furniture is from Ikea. I got all this from Ikea. I got my uh, desk over here from Ikea. We moved to Vegas a few years back and just found the ultimate Craigslist deal. And I got all of this stuff for, I wanna say like 600 bucks or something, just ridiculous, this little guy. And so that's kind of all the furniture. Um, but over here, that's also an Ikea bookshelf. And so you can see, I think that lifelong leaders are lifelong learners. I read a lot of books. I love to always be leveling up and working on myself. And then, you know, just various decor ideas. This is from a South Africa trip. Uh, another thing that I love is actually having atmosphere. A lot of plants, if possible, have them be real. And so you got succulents around here. You got some up here as well. This guy right here, by the way, is the Influence Income Impact poster just made custom online. That's the video influencer's tagline. A couple Kajabi pins for uh, being in the One Million Club and hitting a couple targets in our business. Super pumped about those. And some other, you know, um, and some other, uh, and then of course, uh, about those. And some other, you know, um, 
even some more vibes. We've got a little, uh, and then even some more vibes. Got the doTERRA. Right. Next up, all right. Next up for design ideas, let's talk about light. I think that hitting a couple targets in our business. Super pumped about those. Next up for design ideas, let's talk about light. I think that, especially if you're gonna be creating content, it's nice to have a lot of different light, and also light helps you stay energized when working. And so over here, I've got kind of like a LED light from Amazon, changes colors, has a couple different brightness levels. Over on the other side, a little Ikea light there. I can flip that one on. I'm actually flipping on this light. I that wasn't even on right there. I got a little light there. And then I've also installed a couple lights, kind of just custom. I mean, nothing really fancy, obviously, the gnarly cables. These guys up here are on remotes. And so when I'm live streaming at this desk, we're actually when I'm shooting videos, in front of the desk, like with this as my background. And that guy up there is a little hair light that is controllable by this remote. See that, I can turn those guys off, sorry for the back of the shot. But uh, yeah, lighting, something to consider uh, that can really change your office around is getting necessary. But uh, yeah, lighting, some the shot, but. Uh, so as we're getting through this, a couple things to know. I'm cutting a lot of things out. I'm also trimming restatement of some things. I mean, I notice that I keep rambling on and on and I think, how far back can I go? Can I just, like, if I can cut it, like if it doesn't add to the story, you might as well cut it out. So um, I'm trying to be, videos should be as long as they need to be, but as short as possible. So always look for ways to slim them down um, and to try to honor people's time when it comes to the viewer. Shot. And then let's talk about power. shot and then let's talk, let's talk about power shot and then let's talk about power now now i actually am a power now for the modern entrepreneur content creator let's talk now another cool idea is Now, another cool idea is sir, right, power supply. One of um, the hot key I'm using is spacebar to stop and spacebar. The hot uh, one of the hot keys that I'm using is spacebar to start and stop the video. Right. So I can do spacebar cool L to speed up and plus and minus to zoom in and out on the video. Now, another cool idea is sir, right, power supply. Right. Now, another cool idea for the modern entrepreneur. There is power supplies. This one, the shot. Now, another cool idea for the modern entrepreneur and content creator is power supplies. This one right here, I've got plenty of outlets that I can get on top of my desk, as well as these USB ports. This is a cool one from Aki with a quick charge uh, for my iPhone right there. And you're gonna find those all over on um, the office here. And there's another one over here from Aki, the same one. And so I'll use this oftentimes as a place where I can charge stuff and, um, but now, stuff and, um, but now, uh, but now let's look at a couple other cool areas that I love about this office here. And the first one is, of course, the. All right. But now let's check out a few other areas. Couple, a couple other, a, a few of a, a few of my other favorite spots from this off. A few of my other favorite spots from this office before we head out into the law. A few of my other favorite spots from this office before we head out to the loft is the lens and camera wall right here. Being a tech reviewer, camera fanatic, and having done this for so long, I brought up, you know, I built quite the, I built quite the collection. Of, you know, I built quite the, I, you know, I built quite the, I brought up, you know, I've, I've this for so long, I've built quite the collection of cameras and lenses, and so those all stay organized there. And then I'm also all about the organization over here, this little place where we've got a couple peak design bags that we'll travel out with, real gear, and these little guys, these are perfect little, little satchels for a camera and a lens or two. I always like to collect all of the badges from the lenses I go to, my gosh, mayhem. Uh, but put some headphones up here. I love these things, headphone hooks like this, just kind of a cool home office idea. And um, I like collecting these, thinking through, being able to look through at the end of the year, all the different events and conferences I either spoke at or attended or that we worked for Think Media. One other cool thing I want you to see is this headphone. Another cool, another cool organization, another cool organization idea is headphone hooks. I installed this guy right in here, just screwed it into the wood desk. And I've got kind of my in-ears that I use for live streaming on there, but you could put any piece of headphones. Think media. Another cool media. Think media. Another cool organization idea is headphone hooks. I installed this guy right here, just screwed it into the wood desk. And I've got kind of my in-ears that I use for live streaming on there, but you can put any piece of headphones. Those are also headphone hooks as well on the wall, and that's how I'm able to uh, make that little station over there. Uh, all right. Now, one other thought before we head into the other room, and that is this. Uh, all right. Now, I've got, I've, now. So now, in just a second, I've got a bunch of other cool things to share with you in the loft. And 
people to uh, make that little station over there. So now, in just a second, I've got a bunch of other cool things to share with you with the loft and the other office, but if you're loving this so far, you smash that like and just put the thoughts about how many apps you're in the office, and that's me. And that's the things like, uh, leave plans and possible things all together, like, maybe something from Trade Joe's, just that, there'll be like $6, you'll be like $6, you'll be like $6, you'll be like $6, But I'm a big... All right. Okay, so for a quick update, you can see on our timeline here, we have basically from the intro, we have from the hook, we have the intro right there, and we've gone through all of this editing so far. Now, at this point in the video, I kind of make a, a joke about this little plant. So what I'm gonna do is add a bars and tone. This is gonna add, um, so that it goes into my project files right over here. I can drag it in here. And this is my favorite way to add like a quick comedy beep. And uh, this is just built right into Premiere. See that? So, so, and then right after I say succulent, essentially. Focus. It's a nice succulent. That's a nice succulent beep. And then it kind of resets attention, a little bit of humor. Can we get him in focus? Look at that one, my goodness. My goodness, delete all that. That's a nice succulent comic beep. Goodness, it's a nice succulent. Got that? All right, we'll keep going. But I'm a big atmosphere guy. And so I really want to, but I'm a big atmosphere guy and natural light. Uh, but I'm a big atmosphere guy and, but I'm a big atmosphere guy and natural light if possible. I love sitting at this desk and doing live streams with this natural light from this window. Obviously it's nice to look over the backyard and I understand that our living conditions and the whole office you have to work with are all varying and different and maybe some things you can't change. But when possible, I like being on the second floor with a bigger vision of it. I like uh, having the natural light. I like being able to look over the backyards, the living plants. Uh, I do a little uh, essential oils from the water and some breathe from doTERRA in here, get the atmosphere right. And I just learned that when the office is you know, smelling good, looking good, bright, inspiring, man, that is when I do my best work. And so I'd love to hear from you some of those things that really put you in the creative zone. So let me know in the comments. So that's just a little, uh comments all right so so that concludes this office the comments all right so that concludes this office but now let's head out to the loft and so this is kind of just a home bedroom here on the second story and it's just a very expansive loft up here that i would love to use over here of course to head out into the okay so that concludes the main all right, so that concludes the main office, but we're really just getting started because now it's time to head out into the loft. And so uh, this whole thing is based on the second story of uh, our spot here. And so our living space is kind of downstairs, but mostly upstairs. We're using it for kind of business and YouTube stuff. A couple silver play buttons, pumps for the gold button coming to media pretty soon. And then we've got more books, man, just obsessed with uh, learning business, entrepreneurship, a little bit of decor. Myself too, old white, myself one, old white, right party clock. Well, some of the upstairs, start writing about these ones, and background decor. And I'm in this main area right here. You anything, maybe a uh, cassette, something to sit on the couch, and I'm 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 on the couch, and i am on the couch 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 and i am on refrigerator and in here you're going to find a collection of soda water sometimes we got energy drinks and stuff it's pretty much all sparkling water but a uh, very cool feature that i think is actually available on amazon man i'm in love with it i get a lot of questions about it so definitely check that out if you want link in the description below and speaking of charging stations there's a power st strip right there there's actually one that is hidden right behind there that we can pull out for lighting right here and then we got a little tower over here as well with the aki this is where a lot of the gear happens and you know not super clean another headphone hook cool deal there for the standing desk you gotta have a little decor vibes uh, as well candle for the fragrance and because it's both and and um but then over here but then over here it's all about but then over here it's all about the wire uh, right. but then over here we always like to have our usb-c cables all kind of, all the different tools for whatever kind of but then over here it's all but then over here we always like to have our batteries but then over here, we always like to have our batteries charged up, power banks, USB-C cables, all kinds of different cables, all the different tools for whatever kind of content we need to create. And then over here, man, this is a work in progress. Not super proud of this, but just trying to stay as organized as possible. Whether that's gear review, uh, gear we have review, different microphones. This is kind of the tech that is on deck right here. It's different stuff that we want to cover. We have to shop videos about yet over on Big Media. And then, you know, it takes us over here a little decor. Got that. 
important stuff that we want to cover. We haven't shot videos about. We share, but let's keep going and check. If you were to ask me about below, and speaking of charging stations, there's a power strip right there uh, as well. Candle for the f uh, as well. Candle for the fragrance and because it's both and. But then over here, we always like, but then over here, we always like to have our batteries charged up, power banks, USB-C cables, all cool grid that we got from uh, Urban Outfitters. This guy right here, gift from my mom, a movie reel. Hey, you got the little movie reel. And not that you asked, but this right here is the restroom for the office. And so we kind of tried to tie it all together. Some of you decorated this, my wife, a little bit of that uh, triangle vibes. And that kind of takes us, sorry. And that basically, sh all right, all right. And so, so far you have seen, vibes, and that kind of takes us, vibes, and that kind of takes us, and so, so far you have seen, and not that band, but then over here, we always like to have our batteries charged up, power banks, USB-C cables, all kinds of different cables, all the different tools are for my mom or movie reel. And not that you asked, but this right here is the restroom for the office. And so we kind of tried to tie it all together. Some of you that decorated this, my wife, that's a uh, triangle vibes. And so, so far, you've seen the bulk of the office. We're here in the loft, got all this gear set up. We can work here and uh, the here. Sorry, but there's one other office I show you. This one's work in progress. It's All right, so let's check. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's just check out the second office and uh, prepare yourself because this one is a work in progress. Right now, Kyle and Omar are uh, hiding away as I'm shooting this video. And uh, in here, and we got another standing desk. We got some gear. We're actually building out a podcast studio. I got my King Flip board over here where I can do some training. We use this room a lot for just storage in general from various light kits and tech we need to review. But uh, we're working on doing some uh, paint, probably some shelving, getting some podcast recording and video shooting recording uh, ready for that office. So uh, that will be coming in the future. And uh, three, two, one. All right, so a quick check in here. We basically have all of our A-roll, right? I told the story from beginning to end of walking people through the office tour. So now it's all laid out in the timeline up until this point. I did shoot the outro with a different lens, a little bit of a blurry background to kind of switch things up, just to show kind of the full use of the M50 as a kit. Hey, and so, so much for checking in. Um, let me just cut to that outro. Yeah. I think I can see it right on here. So, hey, Again, I'm looking at the, uh, that the WAV file. You see how much I messed up, like one, two, or three times. And then eventually I know that when I start, the last time is the time I got it right, right? So I can always just get rid of the beginning of all that stuff and then- So thanks for coming along with me for a quick tour through the Think Media offices. If you wanna see any of the various decor or products that I mentioned, I'll put a complete list in the YouTube description below. So go ahead and check that out. If you got value out of this video, smash the like button. And then also, if you have any questions about any of the home office things that I didn't cover or something in the background that you saw, please post those in the comments. And also let me know what some of your favorite home office decor ideas are to keep you inspired and productive. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. And thanks again for checking out this video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Boom. And there's the whole video. So look what we've done. We've got the whole A-roll laid down. And then the next thing I'm gonna do really quick is um, create the end card. So I'm gonna open up Photoshop to do this. Now I've already spent the time building a template um, which allows me to have the subscribe button up there. Remember that when you have an end card on YouTube, it can be a maximum of 20 seconds. So I already have this template created, so I'm just going to change the top video call to action that will end up on this video. Um, I'm gonna give a, a link to maybe a different video I've done. So how to make money on YouTube, great. And then watch another video, that one will be recommended by them. So all I have to do here is go save as, I'm gonna drop uh, you know JPEG on that guy and throw it in a most recent file, how to make money on YouTube and watch how cool this is. Now all I have to do is drop in this end card into my timeline and that'll be the outro of the video. Ideas are that keep you inspired and productive. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Thanks again for checking out this video and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Now, Peace. so I've dropped the end card in there. It doesn't need to be up there for the entire time. I usually only want it up there like 10 seconds or so. And so now I actually want to do music next. So uh, there's a lot of different options for music. I actually have a video here on Think Media with some of the best free options. So if you want to watch that, click or tap the YouTube card or I'll put it in the description below. But if there was one site that I feel like is the best all around for most YouTube creators, it's Epidemic Music. And they just have good pricing. It's very affordable if your channel is not very large. If you have a large channel, it's still affordable. But of course, you can afford it as you start making more money. 
And so um, I already pulled up, as we saw in the beginning, the music folder. And so uh, this is some of the songs I already looked up on Epidemic Music. And so the, one of the reasons why I love Epidemic is because you can really get clear on what music you want fast by just doing something like this. Maybe you say, okay, the mood I want is hopeful. The movement of it, like the pacing, busy, frantic. No, I kind of just want it to be smooth. And then the genre is electronic and dance. I want like beats. So then what it does is it only is showing you hopeful, smooth, electronic, and dance. So we have old school hip hop, beats, disco. You can see the tempo, the beats per minute. You can actually see that it's hopeful and smooth here, the energy level. Just Epidemic gives you so many details. So I spent some time picking out some good music. Okay, so for the, and for the outro, I want that end song to like drop heavy. So I have this song that actually has some lyrics in it. Um, and that is copyright free though, because it's off of a, a site when, once you're paying for it, you're all good to go. So now when I'm also editing music, I like to do something similar. Remember how we were looking at the waveform? I can see where the drops are based on the waveform visually, right? And I've been doing this for a while, so you kind of get used to it, but. Ain't trying late, no time to waste. So that's the build, build. So there's the drop, and that's exactly what we want for the outro. And so it's a little loud. I'm actually gonna go minus five on this guy. And then um, what I wanna do is see the exact drop. There's the exact end card. Waveform wise, there is the exact drop right there-ish. Go back a little. And this has kind of some beats. Nice. So I'm gonna fade that up. So we're gonna jump over here into effects in Premiere, audio transitions, and constant gain. It's kind of weird. You'd think it'd be like crossfade or fade in. It's actually called constant gain. Peace. So I'm letting the song complete, so I'll finish the end card there. And that's, that's kind of it, right? So we've got the music in the end. What we're also gonna do now is now drop some music in the beginning. And for this edit, I'm not gonna go super in depth. I would normally go back through, maybe take out dead spots, do more editing. You could do music throughout, but we're probably just gonna do music in the beginning and the end. And so let's drop a little intro song and we'll mix it in. Okay, so you also heard it there. There's like a little swooshes, little ramp ups or whatever. And if you actually wanna see the songs I use and check out Epidemic Music, I'll put some links in the description below so you can uh, see those. But again, visually here, we can see this. So here's So my opinion is work backwards from the drop. And so if we want the drop right when the logo hits, I'm gonna go minus five again, because it's coming in a little strong. Then I can just pull this out backwards, make sense? And then what I'll do is I'm gonna do a little cut there, right click, audio gain. I'm gonna go minus 18. So I don't want this music to overpower my vocals. So then watch this. Here we go. If you're looking for some home office design ideas, you're going to love this video. My name is Sean Cannell, and I've been a full-time entrepreneur for over four years now, freelancing well before that and working from a home office. So, in this so a couple things here again, in, in editing, I would probably go in and mix the audio more. I'm going to turn this audio up a little bit. This could probably have like a four. This video. I'm gonna... And keep in mind, one thing you want to look at on Premiere is on the right side, there's waveforms. So see these waveforms right here? What you, you don't want that to ever peak. So you want to mix that and you want, you can even get deeper into your audio if you click the audio tab and see how loud your music is. That's audio three compared to how loud your voice is. And then you think about the human ear, if those levels are the same, dude, people can't hear you, the music's overpowering. So you may pull the music down. Um, and I always like to default towards the audience uh, being able to hear the video. So I'm actually gonna make, once the song gets a little bit louder, I'm gonna take it down to like minus 22 here. And I'm gonna mix, we'll go back to our, uh, uh, our editing layout here on Premiere, fade those together. Great, nice little music, and then here we go. Some great ideas for your home office. Coming up. So as that fade went up, I already had the sound effects on my intro, 
boom, the drop happens. And then I made the fade a little longer, as you can see, by you can just stretch it out, slide it around to get exactly where you want the quieter part of the song going up. You could also do this with keyframes. We don't even need to worry about those in this particular tutorial. And so then audio gain over here. Now I'm gonna go like minus 25. I, I want it to just kind of be a nice bed, but uh, more about the vocals of me talking. And so here we go. Little too fast, so I'm stretching out that transition. I'm actually gonna turn the intro down a little bit because of how loud it is compared to me and maybe even turn me up to like without peaking. I'm sitting a little further, so I'm gonna go seven. All right, there we go. Hey, what's up, Sean Tannell here, and welcome to my channel, which is all about going further and faster. Okay, so at this point, we could be done. We could just export the video right now, but there's a few other things I might wanna add in. One being maybe like a title. So let's just create one, and I'll add a couple others later. I'm gonna go legacy title. I know there's a new titling thing on here, but I'm just gonna go easy, fast. And so uh, a really quick way I like to title things is I just create a little black box here on Premiere, and then I'm just gonna go at Sean Cannell. And this way, if you wanna give a call to action to your um, social media, right? And I'm gonna use the font that I love to use. It is um, black italic, and then we'll just go white on that font. So now you can see that right in there, boom, super cool. And that was it. And now that is over here in our media uh, library, our project, and we can pull Sean in. Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell? So hey, what's up, Sean Cannell here. I could add a sound effect, same way, because now you're seeing how layers work, right? So you could add sound right here. These camera clicks, watch me, I'll mute this. That's a sound effect, right? It's edited in. So if I want a little swoosh in and swoosh out, that's a lot of times what we do. Hey, what's up, Sean Cannell? So then over here, I actually do have a plugin. It's called Impact Push. I'll link to it in the description below. It kind of gives you like a nice, not just like a heart. See, it gives you like a motion blur on your uh, animations. And if I click effects here, I want it to come in from the uh, from the left. Sean Cannell here and we'll That's, wow, that was a long journey all the way. I want it maybe from the right then, I guess. Sean Cannell here and welcome to my channel. There you go. So, okay. What's so, up, Sean Cannell here and welcome to my channel, which is all about going further and faster in life. And if we're... Okay, so you see that guy and then I can make him push off as well. So he comes in from the left, leaves the left. I don't know why it actually says right, so whatever. What's up, Sean Cannell here, and welcome to my channel, which is all about going further and faster in life. And okay, so that is basically the full edit, which brings us to actually the export. And so what I'm gonna do is mark out, I'm saying that I want everything underneath this to be exported, but we're actually gonna do that in part four of this video. So I'll tell you all about how you can watch that in just a second. All right, so a few other things that I did after I finished the edit here was I added in some B-roll, right? So the A-roll is on that video layer one inside of Premiere. And then what I did was I added B-roll on top of that uh, at the points where I talked about it. So I just took a few moments to do that, made a few tweaks to the audio, and besides that, our next step now is to export the video and upload it to YouTube. And that's what we're gonna be doing in part four of this series. So if you wanna check out the whole playlist and that next video, just click or tap the YouTube card or post it in the comments below. The mega video of all time continues. Man, if you're still here, let me know that you made it this far in the comments. And let's talk about some of the top questions from the Think Media community all about editing. Corey asks, what's the most efficient workflow, such as preset configurations, templates, having your intro, B-roll, et cetera, organized and accessible? You know, a couple things, Corey. I think, number one, it's all gonna start on your actual hard drive itself. I like to make sure that I stay really organized as far as all of my music in one place, all of the B-roll in one place. Um, I like to have my assets for a project, whether that's the intro, sound effects. When I say intro, I mean like the bumper. I use end cards. We call them end cards at Think Media. Well, that's what YouTube calls them. And it's just a little Photoshop image that we put at the end of the video that we can layer over the end screen 
elements that YouTube gives us access to. So keeping it organized on your hard drive and then remembering that most editing softwares will allow you to save a template of one of your projects or a sequence so that if your videos always have some of the same things, same bumper, maybe same intro song, same few sound effects, same lower thirds of your name and social media icons popping up on screen, you may only need to build that once and then always open up that project and then just drop in the elements that you shot for that video. But I also wanna recommend a video in the resource guide from Omar on the Think Media team. He's got a really cool training about video podcasting and how he does it really fast in Adobe Premiere and keeping like a template for basically pumping out YouTube videos. And he's got some new videos coming up as well. So make sure to check out the resource guide. Anne asks, what is equivalent to iMovie for PC that is free? I need something that allows you to connect all the clips together when it gets cut off by the camera, preferably as easy as iMovie when you just drag and drop. Well, a couple to check out are Blender, DaVinci Resolve, HitFilm Express, and of course I'd recommend maybe Google and see what the top recommendations are. In fact, let us know in the comments if you use any free PC video editing software, keyword that's easy. And Anne, even the ones I recommended, I don't know how easy they are really to learn. I know you're asking on PC, but I think the best video editing software to start with is iMovie if you can get access to a Mac because it's simple, it works fast, it works with Mac. But check out some of the ones I recommended and then read the comments below and we'll highlight any comments of some of the best recommendations for free PC video editing software. That's easy. Braxton Nutt, good to see you, man. Thanks for the question. I use Final Cut Pro 10 and I'm struggling with Adobe Premiere Pro and AF. I think you mean After Effects. Do you have any classes or which classes would you recommend? The two I'd recommend are LinkedIn Learning or Skillshare. In both cases, there are tutorials and training on each. They both have free trials, and so you can always jump into either of them. We'll put some details in the resource guide, and then eventually it becomes a paid trial. If you really wanted to be crazy, you could probably sign up for the free trial, crush it in a weekend, take a couple days off work, learn it, and then you could always cancel, or just stick with those programs because they both have a lot of tutorials about all kinds of great important software that we need as content creators. So Skillshare or LinkedIn Learning. Biscuits and Tea Gaming asks, I always struggle with sound editing. I never know whether my levels are right, music or no music, any tips would be appreciated. Well, I definitely recommend, first off, to always edit with headphones or good studio monitors so you can be monitoring your audio because audio is one of the most important parts of video. But the problem is, it's not just like what it sounds like to you. What you need to measure is the levels. The way to know your levels are right is to actually look at the levels. So in Premiere, what you will see in any editing software should have this is the audio level whenever you're playing your footage. Now, you know, you may have recorded the audio too quiet in your camera. Maybe it's too loud. Hopefully it's not too loud because that's when the audio is blown out or distorted. But then you bring your audio in and you're like, oh shoot, all the audio is like minus 24 dB. It's very quiet. Here's where you want it to be. You want it to be in this range of minus three to minus six, really minus 12, but I like to be right in here without peaking. If you go too high, then it's called peaking and it'll hit this red. So here's Premiere again showing you your levels, right? And if you're hanging out in this area, in this kind of orange yellow area, then levels are good. And if you go too high, then you need to reduce down those levels. And the next thing I'd say is, make sure that you just mix your audio based off the A-roll, typically the voice of your subject. That's the most important part, I think. It's the storytelling, it's the teaching, and music should be complimentary, never overpowering. We call it the grandma rule here at Think Media. And for us, that simply means that if grandma was watching the video, that she would not think that the music is too loud and overpowering the vocals. And so we'd rather play it on the safe side. All you Zoomers out there, you might want your music pumping a little bit harder. But for us, we just think, uh, is it a little bit too loud? Let's go even quieter than that. Is it a little bit music is kind of overpowering the vocals? Let's go a little quieter. Now, when the vocals stop, ramp the music up. Music provides energy, music provides momentum, music provides emotion. But we never want the music or any other element, sound effects or anything, to overpower or any element to distract from the message and the story that you're trying to tell. 
So edit on headphones, edit on some studio monitors, watch your levels, and practice, 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 because audio editing and video editing is an art. All right, Mr. Dan asks, how do I do time lapse and split screen? Well, actually, Mr. Dan, we've got a video on how to do time lapses simply, and so I'll put that in the resource guide in the comment section below. Split screen is gonna depend on your video editing software, and so for specific tips like that without the time in this Q&A to go into it, I encourage you, do that search, and here's how you would search it on YouTube. The thing that you wanna do and the software that you are editing with, and Google as well, right? So you might do Premiere Pro split screen and then see if there's any tutorials out there. And if there isn't a specific tutorial on what you wanna learn, then definitely check out a deeper training from like LinkedIn Learning or Skillshare. My friends, we've come this far, but our journey is not complete yet. We've learned how to film our videos. We're learning about thumbnails. We've learned how to edit our videos, but we've got another step and now we need to export that video and upload it on YouTube. And that's what part four of this series is all about. And then after that, I've got more questions to answer. And so I hope you're still buckled up. I hope you've got your second or third drink or lunch by this time or dinner, depending on what time zone you're in. But now let's get into video number four. So here we go. So what are the best settings for YouTube? You know, it can be kind of confusing and frustrating to figure out the best settings from your video editing software for your video export. So in this video, we're gonna be looking at the best recommended YouTube settings, plus I'm gonna show you exactly how I export a video from Adobe Premiere and upload it on YouTube, coming up. Hey, what's up? Sean here with Think Media, bringing you the best tips and tools for building your influence with online video. And right now we're in the middle of a four part series about how to shoot a YouTube video with a camera like the M50 or a similar DSLR and mirrorless camera, how to do thumbnails, how to edit, and now the best export settings. So if you actually wanna watch one of the other videos in the series, you can click or tap the YouTube card or I'll put a link to the whole playlist in the description below. But I just finished up editing the video that I shot on this M50 and we're taking you through the whole process. Now the next step is to look at YouTube. We're gonna look up the best settings first and then we're gonna go through Premiere and I'm gonna show you exactly how I export videos step-by-step -step with a few pro tips. Let's dive into it. So how do I actually know that these are the best settings for YouTube? Well, the cool thing is YouTube tells us it's recommended upload encoding settings. So I'm gonna link to this page I'm about to show you in the description below, but let's go through it kind of line by line. And the first thing it says is the container. It says that it should be in an MP4. And this is something a lot of people miss. A lot of times people put out like MOVs and other files, which will be fine, but sometimes they take longer to process, they might not look right. So you might as well upload like the best format, and so it's an MP4 format. Next is the audio codec. We're not gonna worry too much about that, but that one um, is recommended there. Next is the video codec, and it's kind of a fancy stuff. Here's the thing, you don't know, need to understand it, just like use it as a checklist, right? So the video codec is H.264, and then it gives you some more stuff, but we can collapse these windows. Now, the frame rate is one of the most important things we wanna talk about. Because here's the thing, if you remember back to part one in the series, and if you haven't watched the full series, again, check it out, we'll link to it in the description below. We talked about how to shoot a video. And when we started out shooting our video, we shot it in a certain frame rate. It's important to keep the frame rate consistent through the whole process. And so what I mean is, if you start in 30 frames, you wanna edit in a 30 frames project, and then you wanna export in 30 frames a second as well. And sometimes when the video looks sketchy or weird or there's weird motion, it's because something was done wrong. Like if you shot it in 30 but export it in 24, it might not look right. If you shoot it you know, uh, in a certain frame rate and mess with the process, and so right here, it talks about common frame rates. YouTube's cool because it will accept other frame rates, but it tells us what those should be. And then it gives us a few other details about it. But here's the probably the most important thing that we need to know, and it's the bit rate. This is actually how large the file size is. Now, when it comes to YouTube, a big mistake people make is they export super large file sizes, not necessarily realizing that YouTube is gonna compress it anyways. What does that do? Well, if you, export your video and it's like a gig, a gigabyte, 
It's going to take you a lot longer to upload, especially if your internet speed is fast. Um, it's going to be down process. It's going to take your computer longer to export probably. And so it's really going to slow down your whole workflow. So when we toggle bitrate, what we want is to actually make the file size essentially the minimum amount of file size that we can have in our software. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So for example, if we were editing a 4K project, we would want the video bit rate to be 35 to 45 megabytes per second, MBS. We shot in 1080 and we shot at 30 frames a second. And so what it's saying is that our video bit rate from a standard frame rate should be 10 megabytes per second. If we had a higher frame rate like 60, and, and why would we do that? Well, if we had a 60 frame uh, frames per second project, Maybe it's because you just like to vlog in 60, but maybe it's because we're doing action sports. We're doing some snowboarding footage and we want you to be able to see all of the motion in that video. Well, then you wanna make sure that you give the file size enough uh, megabytes per second to support all of those visuals and those extra frames that are happening in the video. So now that we know all this, what we can do is jump over to Premiere for our export. So I'm gonna to go to File, Export, and I'm gonna say media. And we'll go through this line by line, but here's what's cool. Format, H.264. Why'd I pick that? Because YouTube told me to, right? And then the preset, it says match source, which is a high uh, bit rate. There are some presets here. We could go YouTube 1080p HD, and that could solve it for you right there. If you look down 1080p, and here's what we can do. We can scroll down to the bit rate. It's actually 16, and maximum bit rate is 16. But guess what? YouTube just told us that actually the bitrate for 1080 only needs to be 10. Now, 16 is gonna be fine. It's gonna probably just look better, like in YouTube might down process it. But if you wanted to speed up your workflow, what you might do is you might say, just match the source, which is gonna be really high. And then I'm gonna scroll down. This all looks good. All of this is pretty much locked in because they're just matching the source. So Premiere makes it easy. But what I can do down here is there it is. See, there's 10 right there. And here's what I like to do. I take the maximum bit rate, I just max that out as high as it goes. Here's what that means. It's basically saying that the target bit rate is 10 megabytes a second. The file for various, the main, for, for the bulk of the video, it'll be 10 frame rates a second. But by having a maximum, let's say there was some scene where you uploaded at, from After Effects and there was crazy motion, or all of a sudden there was all kinds of dynamic stuff happening. And what you needed was a little bit more file size to keep all of those graphical movements looking sharp and not breaking down and becoming pixely or ugly. Then by maxing out your max bit rate, it just gives Premiere the permission to basically do that. So if we wanted the leanest export possible, knowing that there's really no reason to put out a higher quality than this because YouTube's gonna make it 10 megabytes per second, then we're basically good to go with just that. Now, sometimes I'll jump over to audio as well and just make sure that the audio quality is high because I want people to hear uh, hear me. If we look back at the export settings, we could see that for stereo, it's actually 384 kilobytes a second. If it's mono, you want 128 kilobytes a second. And so in this case, we actually have it on the highest 320. So that's great. That'll sound amazing. Keeping in mind that something like a Spotify or a lot of MP3s you might download are more like 128 or sometimes even lower. So 320 is a really good uh, bit rate for audio. So now that's already been set up. So there's really nothing else we need to do here um, except for export it. Now we could queue it um, if we want and use Adobe Media Encoder. I like doing this if you have multiple videos that you've edited in your timeline and you wanna stack them all up. And before we do that, we're gonna do one final thing and just pick where this video is gonna live. I'm gonna go to our most recent folder in Dropbox and I'm going to title it up. So I'm going to say 2019, 06, 12, and this will be the home office ideas on the Sean Cannell channel version one. And, you know, again, sometimes I maybe export a video, watch it, and I'm like, oh, something was wrong. I need to go back and make an edit, but I should be good with that. And then here's the deal. Boom, we're going to hit export. And now it's going to render through that video, process through that video. Now let's actually just take a quick step back before we click that export button, and that is this. When you wanna export a video from a Premiere timeline, you wanna make sure that this area right up here is starting at the beginning of the video and is ending right as the video ends. And so another way to do that is you can actually 
right click right at the end of the video and you could say mark out. This is your out point. So there's an in point, there's an out point. So here's what we're gonna tell Premiere to do. We're gonna say anything underneath this selection area, we want that to be in the final video. If you've ever had a video with like extra black at the end, it's because this was like this and this would just be dead space. Or if you've ever had a video with like unnecessary stuff in the beginning, it's maybe because um, of not having those in and out points set right. And actually, let's say I was to move my file, let's say you had like some weird B-roll over here and a bunch of other footage over here. If you just put your in and out points basically at the front, no matter where your content is on the timeline, then it's gonna export this video, makes sense? So I'm gonna just ripple delete that again, take this back to the beginning of the timeline. And so that is the area and I'm plus, pressing plus and minus to zoom in to make sure I'm right at the end of that video, great. And then I can go to the beginning, zoom in and make sure that it's right at the beginning. So now we're fully ready to export this video. All right, now that the video is fully exported, we're ready to upload it to YouTube. So I have my file folder here with the final files. You also see this is the thumbnail that we designed in part two of this video series. If you actually wanna see my process where I show how to do this in Photoshop, just click or tap the YouTube card and you can go watch that video. And then I also mentioned that sometimes I do an export and there's maybe something wrong. So I actually ended up with two versions of this video. So just a tip, you know, I played this back and then I was like, okay, let me tweak some things. So uh, I changed it, I made version two. This is our final video file here on my desktop of the computer or rather in this folder. So now I'm ready inside of my YouTube studio beta for my YouTube channel here. I'm gonna click the little upload video icon up here at the top and it's pretty straightforward. All I need to do is drag this video right over to the upload and it's gonna upload it here on YouTube. Now. A huge thing that I would recommend that we don't have time to cover in this video is this is where everything starts. I mean, the title, the description, the tags, of course, the thumbnail that we uh, talked about in part two. This is everything if you wanna get your video discovered. Remember, content is king, but marketing is queen and she runs the household. So if you actually wanna learn about mastering the marketing of YouTube, the title, the description, the tags, even topics, and some of the best ways to get views and subscribers, check out my free masterclass at thinkmasterclass.com or I'll also link to it in the description below. Boom, all right, now our video is exporting and going on YouTube. But here's the thing, this brings us to the end of our four part series, but really the beginning of what I believe is the most important part of our YouTube journey and that is the strategies. That's the kind of things that you do after you upload the video, the titles, the description, the tags, and all of that kind of stuff. So if you've been loving this series and you want some more training about how to actually get views, optimize your videos, and some of those next steps, I have a free masterclass and it's about an hour long and I walk you through exactly my strategies for how I title videos, position videos, so they get massive views, and that's how I was able to quit my job and go full-time on YouTube. So if you wanna watch that, it's at thinkmasterclass.com, or I'll post a link to it in the description below. You can watch it free for a limited time. Normally, it's a part of some of our advanced courses that we have students that go through to learn YouTube at a higher level, but you can watch it free for a limited time, so check it out in the description below. What a journey we've been on together. What a saga the Think Media Chronicles of YouTube video production. And we've got more questions to answer from you in the Think Media community all about uploading and the process of getting more views on your videos. So let's just jump them into them. Avisha Vlogs asks, I use Shotcut and sometimes it takes 50 to 60 minutes to export a 10 minute video. While when I export a video of one minute or less, it takes less than one minute to export. Thanks so much for the question. I checked out some of your videos and you are a great artist. And here's a few thoughts when it comes to exporting videos. There's a lot of factors. First of all, your software. I don't know much about Shotcut. That's another free software recommendation, by the way, Think Media. But sometimes the software itself might be slower when exporting videos. That doesn't probably explain the discrepancy, but that's one thing to consider. The next thing is the video file size itself. 4K can take longer to export than 1080p, and the actual video codec can slow down exporting. So some cameras shoot in AVCHD. Sometimes GoPro footage, what old school GoPro footage used to be harder to export than you know, smoother footage from a DSLR or MP4. And I know that's all kind of confusing terms, but like the file format itself can slow down the export. Next, 
if you stack different layers of clips on top of each other, if you've got different B-roll or effects will slow down the export. If you make something blurry or you add color grading, all of that can slow down the export as well. My thing is that maybe Shotcut um, doesn't have a problem with the quick export, but when you throw 10 minutes at it, maybe it bogs down. Uh, when it comes to exporting, you really just need to test. And if you wanna speed exporting up, think about everything I just mentioned in terms of your video workflow, the file size, the codecs. Think about investing in a faster machine eventually if you want faster exports. And then think about your software itself. Just changing your software could lead to a faster export. And one other thought about that is I've learned that Mac is oftentimes the fastest when you combine like a Mac computer with Mac software. Why? Because the computer company manufacturer also made the software. So iMovie Final Cut Pro 10 meets a Mac computer together fast. Where even if you go Mac computer Premiere Pro, it's not as fast. It still can be fast, but like it's a different software producer than the hardware producer. So I threw a lot at you just now. It's a combination of a lot of things. Test, experiment, read forums, watch YouTube videos, and make sure you're subscribed here at Think Media for more tips and we can do some dedicated videos on this very topic. Sebastian asks, I shoot on the EOS R and I heard Maddie say when he uploads on the R, he films in 1080p, edits in 1080p, but uploads in 4K because of the R's nitrate or something. How legit is this? Also, can it be done in Final Cut Pro? It's easy to do from Premiere Media Encoder, but I wonder on Final Cut since it's not my primary editor. Thank you. First thing, I'm not sure about the R nitrate. However, there is some intelligence to actually uploading in a higher resolution, even if you didn't shoot in that higher resolution. One reason why is YouTube will actually give you a higher bit rate, meaning theoretically and even truthfully, your 1080 will be better in 1080 and even in 4K if you export it in 4K when you upload it to YouTube. Uh, the same is true about 1080 60 frames a second versus 1080 30. YouTube gives more of a bit rate to the file when it's larger. Bottom line, that it's kind of a hack. It's also kind of a hack to trick YouTube into the fact that the video is 4K. They're not gonna know the difference. It is 4K, it's just 1080p up process to 4K. And so besides the nitrate question, I think that it's a smart move regardless for those that are still tracking with me. Next, can it be done in Final Cut Pro? I don't know, I'm not a Final Cut Pro user, so I'd probably Google that and see if it's possible. It's certainly possible in Premiere, but here's another alternative. Edit the video in 4K. All you'd have to do is you know, scale the files up. In Premiere, it's pretty easy to say, scale to fit the frame, um, or you could just stretch them and then copy paste that effect across all the different clips to just actually edit the file in 4K. The reason for doing this Again, it's not ultimately gonna make it look crispier, but then if you put titles on it, those are gonna be 4K titles. If you maybe pull images in, the images, are, they're all gonna be stretched to 4K. So that final export will be in 4K. Then you throw it on YouTube, it's gonna be in 4K. But a lot of people are gonna probably watch it in like 480, 720, or 1080, and it'll look better overall. We just got super geeky. So if you're still with me, can you smash the like button? If you're this far in the video, tell me in the comments that you're this far in the mega video. And let's take a commercial break right now so you can check out Grow With Video Live, our annual event that we have here in Vegas. Because guess what? Live in Vegas with me is gonna be the whole Think Media team. We'll have Kyle and Omar and Tony and Nolan. And we, we use different software. Some people are editing on Final Cut and they know these tips. And some people are editing on Premiere. So if you wanna network with other purpose-driven creators and entrepreneurs, and uh, you want to kind of you know take your video game to the next level not just technically but strategically and what's working to get views on YouTube on LinkedIn video on Instagram all those things check out growwithvideolive.com roll the ad break and I'll be back for some more questions in a second tickets are on sale now for grow with video live 2020 get all the details and claim your ticket before it sells out at growwithvideolive.com Jenny asks, are the YouTube export options in Adobe any good? Jenny, I'd say yeah, they are a shortcut 
to just getting the best export settings for YouTube. Adobe's probably looked into that. And what Jenny's referring to here is that Adobe tries to make it easy for you by on the drop down window saying, select 720p for YouTube, 1080p for YouTube, 4K for YouTube. And so if you wanna just keep it simple, you could select those. However, in the video I just showed, all the settings that I did, if you wanna follow those step by step in Premiere, then those are really good as well. They're based on some of my other research and just kind of coming up with the ideal export settings based off of YouTube's recommended settings. So I'd say this, Jenny, in either case, your videos should look great. So Splish Splash asks, do you back up all of your exports even after op uploading? Even so, how many hard drives do you have? Yes, those original exports of all the videos are somewhere. Uh, do I know where they are? I don't know. These days we are a decentralized unit of renegade media creator savages at the Think Media team. Over here, if you look, we've got, you know, I don't know, piles of hard drives. I've got these three. This one came from LA. Nolan uses that one. We got all these ones. In the other room, we've got a NAS, a network attached storage. We're supposed to use that to drop all of the collective of our backed up footage. That means our original footage as well as our export footage on there. We got a Dropbox. We got a lot of stuff on there as well, uh, but not necessarily those final exports. We do think of YouTube as a place where a lot of times when we're editing, we'll still download the file off YouTube just because it's faster and edit that in. But of course, there's some quality loss on that. And so I think that where we are at Think Media, I started this channel 10 years ago shooting videos in my bedroom, and now fast forward a decade, and it's grown into like this crazy company with like a bigger team that's kind of decentralized. And so how many hard drives do you have? A lot. How many hard drives do you need? As few as possible. I think what I would recommend is probably have some kind of a working drive you know, if we edit on a laptop, we really love the Samsung SDs that are light, they're fast, and um, you can just, you know, plug them right into USB-C or the new Thunderbolt PC. They're really fast as well. And, and that's a drive that you can really edit off of fast, especially if you're doing 4K. But then maybe you want a drive, I just sent a six terabyte older kind of Western digital basic drive to LA with Nolan just as a backup drive, just as a place to like have redundancy. And then eventually you want even more redundancy, meaning if it's only in one place, it's in no place. If you got one, you got zero. If you got two, you got one. What? And that it's in terms of the locations. Why? Because if you have a hard drive fail, what would happen to that footage? And so think about redundancy, think about backups, think about do you even need it in the future? That's a lot and we actually will put in the resource guide some of our recommended videos about network attached storage and hard drives with more tips. Domingo asks, how do you get the right tags, names, and description? Well, Domingo, that is a great question. We'll link in the resource guide some of the best videos we recommend here at Think Media. Check those out, but again, the best resource we have on that is my free one hour YouTube web class at thinkmasterclass.com. This video, of course, is about the production side, the filming side, the gear side. That free masterclass at thinkmasterclass.com is a one hour training all about what you're talking about. How do you title your videos, optimize your videos so they get more views. So if you haven't seen that yet, definitely check it out. Jasmania asks, which video resolution do you personally recommend exporting in 1080p or 4K? Is there a substantial difference in either? So we've already touched on that a little in Q&A, but a few additional thoughts. There is a substantial difference. I mean, 4K, when we shoot with our a7 III Sony camera, which is our higher end favorite camera, and we did a video of like what's in our camera bag right now for 4K shooting events and whatnot. We'll put that in the resource guide. That looks just beautiful. 4K is crispy, it's beautiful. 1080 looks great. We're shooting on the a7 III right now in 1080p, and it also looks good, but you, there is a substantial difference in sharpness and detail. If you think about it, 4K is four times bigger than 1080p. Like you could fit four 1080p clips in your 4K footage, and so, Yes, there's a difference. Now, is it a deal breaker? I mean, you tell me in the comments. How do you think about this video? This whole video has been in 1080. The M50 footage that I shot for the four-part series was in 1080. And so um, I think both are, are really solid. Of course, a lot of people are gonna be watching on their phones. 
but then other people are gonna be watching on their 4K TV. So use what you have now. If you've got a 4K camera and you can edit in 4K, then you might as well do it because you are gonna prepare yourself for the future. If you don't have it yet, don't get stuck. Keep creating content now with what you have and then as you generate income, as you create momentum, level up your gear, your computer, your editing, your software as you go. Lens, why does it take so long? 4K. Yeah, Lens, the reason 4K takes so long to export and do everything is because as we just mentioned, it's so much bigger. It's four times bigger than 1080p, so it takes longer to edit, takes longer to back up the footage, file sizes are bigger. If you gotta send it to an editor or something, which definitely, if you ever plan on hiring an editor or you're a business owner that's gonna work with a virtual assistant, it's things to consider because 4K will take longer to upload and transfer and put on Dropbox. And uh, I think those are the reasons. Here's the deal. If you have a fiber connection uh, on your internet, your internet home speed, as, as 5G rolls out, as computers get faster, 4K will be more practical. And this is a good point to bring up. This is maybe one reason why even if you have access to 4K, it's nice to stick with 1080p is for speed. And in 2020 and beyond, speed matters big time for building your brand, building your channel. It's never just about one video, it's about quality, but also quantity. And so think about if you've got the assets to support a fast 4K workflow, and if you don't, you might wanna stick with 1080. All right, man, just clap it up, come on, for yourself, for your family, for your future. You made it this far, let me know in the comments. The Mega Think Media How to Shoot, Edit, Upload video has reached part four, but guess what? We're not done yet. Yes, we've come a long way, but we're really just getting started because once you release a YouTube video, then it's all about getting views, it's all about connecting with people in the comments, it's all about building your brand so that you can impact people, so that you can make money online, so that you can build a legacy, and that's what our passion is here at Think Media. And so the question of the day is did you make it this far? There's been a lot of questions. Definitely take advantage of the resource guide in the description below. And then what I want you to do next is check out our video here on Think Media all about how to get more views on YouTube. There's three specific tips for how to come up with good video ideas, get more views, that'll go deeper into the content that you just learned. So click or tap the YouTube card to check that out, and I will see you in the next video. Peace.